and how far you can see. If there's not a cloud in the sky and you can see the horizon, we call that clear in a million. Clear in a million vodka is the spirit of adventure. It's a premium vodka and we're, we're looking to reach the demographic that's adventurous, that's resourceful, that's responsible, and that likes to get out into the wilderness and into the outdoors. Uh, it's going to take our customers out of their cubicle and into the wilderness. So let's talk a little bit about the vodka market. Uh, the vodka market in 2013 was $2.4 billion industry, uh, and it's expected to grow at about 1% uh, over the next five years. Uh, within that vodka, premium vodka, which, is, which will be clear in billion, uh, accounts for about $950 million. If you take a look at the distilling, the distilled spirits industry on whole, uh, the top line is vodka. And as you can see, it's growing a lot better than anybody else. And in fact, some of them aren't really growing much at all. Uh, so this is by far the biggest part of the distilled spirits market, and it's the only one that's really growing. So first we're going to attack Oregon, uh, and we're going to attack uh, people that are making over $75,000 a year. And within Oregon, there's about 700, or excuse me, 470,000 people earning over 75K a year. 12% uh, of the sales in the state are craft distilleries, which is what we are going to be. Um, so based on our uh, marketing plan, uh, the market size, uh, we're expecting within the first year to sell only about 200 cases. A case is 12, uh, 750 milliliter bottles, and that's due to the regulatory process and just setting up the distillery and everything. After that, year two, about 1,300 cases, and year three, a little over 5,100 cases, which is about 60,000 bottles. How do you come up with those numbers? Uh, by growth rates, uh, how many we can sell to uh, first, uh, the, there's about 250 stores within Oregon, and um, stores. We have to get to the stores, we have to get to the store uh, managers. They will uh, tell us, they will order from OLCC. And uh, so the first year is going to be uh, pretty light. And then after that, we're expecting with the marketing campaign to uh, grow at about 40%. Okay. So these are our first local competition. These are the small guys that we're going to uh, uh, knock out before we head for the big guys. Uh, Crater Lake out of Bend. Uh, Bull Run makes a Mayoff vodka, and then uh, Portland Potato Vodka in Portland as well, and then uh, Dry Fly up in Washington. Uh, one of the big things to note about our competitors, at least the local competitors, is how they market their vodka. Uh, they market the product, and if you study the vodka market long enough, you'll find out that none of the successful companies sell a product. They sell a lifestyle. They sell a story. And these guys don't do that. Uh, yeah, their, their marketing, if you look at their websites, it's, it's pretty sad. So we think that by approaching the market correctly, uh, selling a story, selling a lifestyle, that we'll be able to overtake them fairly quickly. And then we're going for the big dogs. Uh, on the side, you'll see all the, all the uh, name brands that you hear about and that uh, most people buy. Uh, Kettle One, which is owned uh, by Diageo, at least 50% by Diageo, um, they are a great example of how an approach to marketing can really uh, affect a brand. In 2003, they were selling a million cases a year, which is a, a lot of vodka, but uh, they're up over 2.4 million uh, as of 2013, and that was based on a marketing campaign uh, that you've probably seen uh, that's it's very, very effective. So they've more than doubled. And so how are we going to take market share from those large conglomerates you just saw on the graph? We believe we have a couple competitive advantages over both the local um, distilleries as well as some of the major conglomerates. Our first one is we're offering a unique product. We're offering a vodka that is based from whey. This whey is only used in two other micro distilleries in the world. One being in New Zealand, the other one being in England. And as Curtis talked about, the marketing and the branding campaign is so important to the success of these brands. 
and those two, we believe, are not doing it correctly. Whey is also extremely cheap. Currently, there's no use for this whey, so these creameries that produce it as a byproduct are having to pay to uh, discard it, whether they're treating their wastewater or giving it to a biofuel or a anaerobic digesting facility, they're still having to pay. We believe that we can negotiate a tipping fee where we take a smaller amount um, and they pay us to pay us to take the product off their hand. And if that doesn't work out, we believe we can get this for possibly free. We also, uh, to reiterate, we have a number of relationships with dairies that we've built from our work experience as well as our exploration of this product idea. So uh, how are we going to make money? Uh, we're going to sell vodka. And uh, <laughs> first, we're going to sell vodka in Oregon. Uh, the state of Oregon is one of the very unique ones. Most of them are privatized. This one is entirely controlled by the state of Oregon. So everybody sells to OLCC. You sell to OLCC, there are two warehouses that they house uh, your product in, and then the uh, liquor stores will order from the warehouses, and they'll ship the vodka to the liquor store and sell it. All on-premise and off-premise sales go through these local liquor stores. So if you're a bar or you're a uh, restaurant or a club or whatever, uh, you're buying from these liquor stores as well. Uh, so everything goes through them. The key to the Oregon market is OLCC. Um, <clears throat> we estimated it's going to cost a little bit under five, uh, a little under six dollars to produce each bottle, and then we're going to sell it to OLCC for thirteen seventy-two. They're going to mark it up about one hundred and four percent. Uh, and sell it at about 28 bucks a bottle. This gives us a gross margin at 57%, so not that bad. And uh, the overall, and then, uh, sorry, the tasting rooms, uh, Oregon just passed a law a couple of years ago that allows uh, distilleries to run tasting rooms and sell bottles out of those tasting rooms. The margin there will be even better. So. How do we run a tasting room? Where? Yeah. Uh, at the distillery. So yeah, would that be in Eugene or Springfield or? It, uh, it, it depends. We haven't looked exactly at, we, Eugene area for uh, rent is about $5 a square foot. I can't remember. It's, uh, uh, I'd have to look at the financials. Okay. But we're looking at a 5,000 square foot facility. To uh, make this stuff. To make this stuff. I have a question. And we put it in there. Yes. So you say that using the, um, the way is a competitive advantage? Mm -hmm. It is. And that it's going to make the cogs less? Yes. So what do you think Kettle One's cogs are? Well, they have the economies of scale that we don't have right now. So they, uh, I'm not exactly sure what their cogs are, but uh, they are less than ours. Uh, the typical profit margin after everything for this industry is about 8%, and um, uh, we think we can beat that significantly based on the fact that 50% of their cogs is for um, Input. inputs, like coarse grains, which is also a very volatile uh, commodity. So we would have a much stabler financial model, and we would have a, uh, much lower cogs uh, than our competitors. And especially, uh, we're looking to uh, install more efficient stills later on, uh, year three, year four, after we start making uh, some money, uh, that will uh, bring that down even further as it increases our efficiency. So can you negotiate with OLCC, or is it, do they set prices for the type of um, liquor that you bring in there? They, whatever you sell it to them, they mark it up uh, 104%, almost 105. So your sale price is 49% of the total cost. Yes, I'm just curious about the name vodka. Is there any restrictions on you calling your whey product vodka? Really, that's the only one that we could use. Well, vodka and gin, uh, because of the input. Uh, federal regulations say that if it's going to be a whiskey, it's got to have grains. Uh, every type, uh, if it's going to be rum, it's got to be made of sugar. Uh, so every, every big name is coded in the federal regulations as to what it can be made out of. And vodka doesn't have that Vodka doesn't have any restrictions as to what it is made out of. So. Is this the same kind of way you use for like protein powder? No. no. Similar. So that's what Blake was talking about, the sweet way. Yeah. So sweet way is what is in the protein powder. So, but it's spelled the same correctly? Yeah. It's just two. It's just the... Uh, 
kind of chemical makeup of this specific type of way. Um, and it still has the same protein uh, characteristics, but due to the chemical makeup of it, you can't powder it as easy and you can't put it into protein bars and stuff. So will you have like a whey on the vodka, like what say with anywhere? One of our, we've identified that kind of the sustainability as well as um, what the product necessarily is made out of is going to be kind of a second message to our consumers. Uh, we're first going to relay it as a premium vodka that is trying to capture um, an affluent community that has enjoyed the outdoors and respects the outdoors. And then um, due to their interest, that will be a, a second message to them. Did you have a question back there, sir? I did, but that kind of answered part of my question. Because wait, wait to me, I'm not a big vodka drinker, but it, it's a milk byproduct, right? Right. It kind of sounds gross. Yeah. Bit, you know, yeah. So I think it's good that you're not going to you know, be promoting that as a, you know, yeah. yeah. Them, the funny thing is, there's a uh, vodka in the UK that they're calling uh, Black Cow, and it's their branding is a milk vodka. So we've had uh, very slow adoption. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the whey vodka out of uh, New Zealand and uh, Black Cow milk vodka, they're they're going pretty slow. They're not really making much uh, momentum. So. so let's talk about the growth plan a little bit. Um, <clears throat> The West Coast is the largest um, demand and consumption of vodka in the nation. And with our we start in Oregon, uh, we can kind of get a foothold, get our manufacturing facilities, as well as our distribution and branding component down. And then our next move, about year three, two to three, will be uh, Washington and California, the other two major states within the region. A couple of obstacles that could possibly inhibit our growth or bar us from continuing our, on our idea. Um, the first and most important one is the regulatory environment. As Curtis said, this is a controlled state and the permitting and regulation process could possibly take anywhere from 10 to 24 months. During that time, you have to have a facility that reaches code for a distilling um, facility and you have to be paying either rent, you have to own that facility, or whatever it might have. That can be a long, costly thing for a startup phase business. Other than that, again, I think you guys might know that there's a huge key to success in the marketing. And so getting adoption quickly and with a large target audience is key. Sorry. I know with like wine, you can have like custom crush agreements and do sort of your own custom wine things at these different wineries. Mm -hmm. I don't, is that, do they have any of those same things so you don't have to go through the same two year period? I know you miss out on maybe a tasting room or something that right. on that side of capital, but is that an option that would make it a little quicker launch for you so you don't have to actually have them come and inspect your facility? Yeah, it is. And we just kind of identified that recently that we can do partnerships and co-pack agreements with other local distilleries. Um, and that would obviously get us off the ground much quicker. So how are we, oh, okay. Have you guys made the product? Uh, are, is there any representatives from the TTV in this room? <laughs> you? <laughs> uh, if not, then uh, if there are, I plead the fifth. I was to have some taste. <laughs> oh, um, we, we have made some stuff and it tastes not too bad. <laughs> it's pretty smooth, but it's a learning process. <laughs> You're just, I'm just disappointed that you didn't uh, have tasting in class. You know, yeah. Red, Red, Red Dead Ketchup for that, come on. So, would you be on the hook for uh, dealing with the school? No, I won't. I'm not it off All right, so how are we going to make our investors money? Uh, these companies are the big, uh, the big hitters in the distillation industry. Uh, and in the last 10 years, they've been buying up vodka companies. Uh, Jim Beam acquired Pinnacle uh, and all of their different flavors for $650 million in 2012, or $605 million. Uh, Pernod Ricard bought Absolute Vodka for $8.3 billion uh, in 2008. Svedka was bought by Constellation uh, for $384 million. And then Diageo has bought a couple of vodka companies, the most uh, recognizable people being Kettle One in uh, 
2011. So, and they, all of these companies, the, the rough uh, order of magnitude for what, their, what the purchase price is, is they're about 10 times of uh, yearly revenue. Eight to ten times, depending on. We've uh, estimated how big do you have to be to be acquired? Uh, that's kind of a. Uh, that depends. There, Diageo bought this Ursusa vodka in 2004 for 190 million, and it was had less than 20 million dollars in sales. So, um, once we push out of Oregon and out of the Northwest, that could come very quickly. Okay. And we believe one of the main attractions for us is that we're capturing this target audience of an affluent um, weekend warrior who right now, none of these major conglomerates have a brand in it that is capturing that audience. Does this weekend warrior have a gender? No. It's not gender specific. Um, in our customer research, we've identified that depending on what the situation is, uh, it could be male or female. So in your research, you didn't show that like um, vodka drinkers are mostly male and female, with both. No, most uh, most they they tend to uh, kind of split down the middle. You know, women like to drink it in cocktails. Guys uh, like their vodka tonics, you know, or vodka soda. I mean, it, it's it's not as clear as you would hope. So we've estimated that we're going to need about five hundred thousand dollars to get this idea off the ground. 150 of which will go to building a facility. Obviously, if we go with the partnership, uh, the 150,000 could be scaled down from there. We'll need 300 thousand dollars to build our brand. It's a key to success. Um, we're really trying to drive this branding and marketing campaign, and we estimate that that's going to take about 300 thousand dollars. The last 50 will go to the permitting and regulatory environment of how to get a distilling permit, either a partnership, um, or whatever it might have. So with that, we'd like to open it up for some questions. Cool. What are you spending that 300 on? Uh, that will be a lot of different things. From uh, We plan on hiring a marketing firm uh, to help uh, build this brand and then to get our uh, name out there, whether that be uh, Pandora, uh, radio, uh, what, whatever the case may be. We're also going to take a, uh, <clears throat> a big, uh, we're going to do a lot of social media marketing. Fireball is a great example of this. Fireball went from uh, 2011 selling 1.6 million to 2013 selling 60 million. And they did it all based on social media. Can you do that though if, you, if you're only in Oregon? What are the like cross-state licensing issues? With this, so if you're producing in Oregon, you need some sort of special. How do you get out? How do you get across the country? How do you get nationwide? That's what the like, fifty thousand dollar fees are for. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's 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 actually uh, perfectly. You should. Yeah, it might not be enough, but uh, that's a reasonable mm -hmm. We don't know. We'll hire somebody. And when we we're in our growth plan, when we choose to go to California or Washington. Um, a lot of that is going to be us reaching out to distributors, finding a distributor to carry our product in certain regions, and working with them from there. So, try uh, I'm sure this will be investor specific, but I didn't know if uh, for these type of companies that are launching and they're, you're asking for the $500,000 to launch, is that normally probably not an equity stick? They're taking like debt in your equipment and things like that so they can kind of get that? Or how does that normally What's work in that industry? This industry doesn't have many investors. Like, there's not venture capitalists that that focus on boozing for the most part. Diageo actually has set up a, uh, a kind of uh, corporate venture capital thing, but they're only investing a couple hundred thousand in each company. So we, I, through, I couldn't find many that would really invest in that because the timeline tends to take longer. So uh, to get a company that's big, that's making hundreds of millions of dollars, you've got to be in the game for a little bit longer than 10 years. So, so where's the half million coming from? Who's, who's investing? What's a typical investor? You. What is it? Is it a loan? Is it a... No, it will be from sort of um, small investors. 
Curtis was just talking about like the VC route. Mm -hmm. So this yeah, would be no, yeah, maybe yeah. C we, we hadn't thought so much about that. Uh, we, were, we were hoping that you know yeah. meeting with our going forward. Yeah, that and Nathan and Al would be able to help us answer that question. Sure. What about your team? You didn't really speak about your team. Investors uh, want want to know who the team is. Mm -hmm. You've emphasized that this is a brand play. Mm -hmm. So who's the brand expert in this space or who's going to become the brand expert in this space to lead that strategy? Because that's, I think I would agree that's going to be super critical. Right. And you won't get a lot of time to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, it'll be a high stakes game for you. So have you identified some resources, some some communication firms, some people that are in the space that you're going to rely on to come up with just a top the charts marketing and brand strategy? I've identified, um, there's one firm up in uh, Portland called ANSI Healy, and they're more of a graphics design and marketing firm. Um, and I've worked with them with my past work experience, and they do great work. And uh, other than that, we haven't looked at a ton of branding experts or consultants. Yeah. Okay, so you talked about your market segment being people making over seven hundred or seventy five thousand mm -hmm. mistake. But more specifically, because you're talking also about these people being sustainability focused and outdoorsy and all that. So if you actually dive down to your market segmentation, how big is that market? Like how big is that segment? Um, what are they consuming currently and how much? Yeah, that uh, is some very, very difficult information to obtain for free. Uh, so we had census data, that's where I pulled the number for 470,000 uh, people in Oregon, but we don't have that data. We Are love terribles? Like, um, I don't know how many pairs of smart little socks does that guy sell? I mean, something that, that'll give you some sort of like a, a, an idea of how much you have to chop up that 470,000 mm -hmm. people. To get to the, your actual um, target market. Yeah. Have we identified any variables? It, yeah, variables. Uh, no, we we haven't. Not at this point. It's actually a great idea. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? No. All right. Cool. Thank you. So now we'll do some feedback from everybody. Feel free if you want to copy your cookies or whatever to get up and do that. Um, I thought you guys did a very, uh, very good job on getting it off and running. I think you have some a broad scope. You have probably a lot of unanswered questions on the details of how you make all this work. But yeah, absolutely. Generally, I would say that was uh, pretty solid. Um, other feedback from the group? Yeah, come on. Uh, I think casually uh, saying yeah, that you guys are going to do dumb shit is not a very good idea. Uh, to say what? To, to casually say that your competitors are basically dumb shit is what you get. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't think that's a very good idea. That, um, they're not, obviously. Just, I mean, even making a local vodka company and, and that you and have a big enough brand that you even know about it is not easy. Yeah. And to say, yeah, we're just going to blow these guys off the map, and then we're going to go for these big guys, sounds like hubris, sounds like you're not going to get your funding. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's just, that's just my opinion. So, uh, I'd second that. If I were going to give this uh, presentation again, I could really back that yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. You might talk about how they're yeah. like from the roots right. growing, but they're missing this key ingredient, right? Okay. They're missing branding, or their branding is separate than you think the, the path to branding might be. Um, other feedback, Joe? So the to the acquisition strategy, how big the acquisitions have been, how many there have been from the big players was actually really interesting. And you kind of put that at the end. So I was at the end and you said, yeah, Thanks, acquisitions are happening couple, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars um, when they get to 20 million to 60 million sales. That's pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. So that you know, have, so I would have should have put that right more. behind our idea. Um, Highlighted it, highlighted it more. I mean, that, that really made it sound like, oh, so if you do do this, there's actually a good exit strategy here. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it, it's not a pipe dream. And I would actually throw out some examples. Um, I don't think you answered the question well enough, which is how big do you have to be to exit? And when I, it's like, well, how many, how much sale? How long do you have to exist? How many employees do you have? 
what does it actually look like? I just kind of vague in the final question. If you'd answered that more clearly, I would have said okay. 50 people, five years in business, $20 million in sales, and that, if I don't know what business would mean, I would have been like, that, that seems possible. I guess I would add to what um, Jeff said. Uh, you know, because one of the points he kept making was we're going to beat these guys over and over again on marketing and building our brand. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they know the importance, you know, these local competitors that you mentioned, that they know the importance of having a strong brand in this space. Just that advertising um, is very expensive. The $300,000 budget you have is like basically grass grassroots. I mean, these, you know, that the one vodka company that you mentioned that's doubled their sales, they probably spent 10, 20 million dollars on that marketing campaign. It's a very, very expensive endeavor. So, if in your in your in your presentation you're gonna <coughs> highlight you know, your ability to market your product over the other products, you, you really should be more specific about how you're gonna do that. You know, you have some industry connection. You know, some guy at Netflix is gonna run a commercial for your vodka before every episode of their most popular popular series or, or whatever, you know, but just saying that we're gonna beat them on marketing and we're gonna knock them off first and move on to the other, you know, large competitors just I don't think that's the sign of flat. I have one more. I I don't want to take pop shots at you guys, but it, it's um it feels a little incongruous to me that, that on the one hand you're, you you start talking about way and it's a waste product and you can basically get it for free or they'll pay you to take it. But then, then you turn right around and you start talking about this big marketing campaign you're going to do. The marketing campaign sort of has nothing to do with the way, the way product. I, I, and, then, and that was why I kept asking about the cost of goods and things like that, because it didn't really feel like you hammered that home. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm with him that, that vodka made from milk product sounds kind of weird. And, um, and so that's going to hurt the brand, right? If you're, if you're going to go invest a ton of money in this brand and then people find out it's made for milk, that's weird. But those, those two things go on in Congress. Are you guys actually doing this, or is this just a hype uh, that still trying to decide? Yeah, yeah, we don't know. So we only have 10 now. weeks to, to look into this, so yeah. I don't think we have nearly enough information. Right. Yeah. Because it seems like the idea that, especially if you have connections, to get this stuff for free, and you can do something with it, whether it's make vodka or whatever it is, that would be an awesome business idea. Taking on Diageo is not an awesome business idea. Um, <laughs> it, it, so it's, it's sort of like somewhere in the middle, you know, somewhere more, more on the wayside is what I would, I would look for. Yeah. You, yeah. you bring up a good point about um, the milk products. Is, are, are all the milk proteins consumed? Is all the lactose consumed? Well, distillation, I mean, that's how you purify water, is, so everything, when you get some congeners, they call it some little bits of stuff that, but nothing that, like, you don't have to label it, this is a lactose-containing product. Like, they call... I think you're going to have to prove that. Yeah, oh, it's, no, we it's, also have a relationship with uh, analytical chemist who's planning to run a couple um, tests on our product to see, actually, what are the characteristics and what is the makeup of it, and do we have to label it as um, a dairy product? So people, so that's a definite route and an obstacle. Are you guys passionate vodka drinkers? I mean, do you like love stuff? <coughs> think about all the time? No, I like whiskey. Yeah, I like whiskey too. Yeah, uh, can't make whiskey that way though. Yeah, I mean, my experience with beverage industry is if, like you aren't dreaming about this stuff when you wake up in the morning and. We can make we can make gin out of it. We're not cooking uh, our passion yeah. to do it, you know. It's we can make gin out of it, which I like gin. Yeah. What's the difference between that? Too? Gin is, is actually just flavored vodka. It's uh, mm -hmm. but it's specifically flavored by juniper berries. That's it. Mm -hmm. What's driving the vodka growth? Is that red Bull? Yeah. Flavors. Flavors. It's flavors. Yeah. Cinnabon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pinnacle makes a Cinnabon. No. Pinnacle. Yeah. Pinnacle makes a Cinnabon. Flavored vodka now. Cinnabon flavored vodka. Yeah, Cinnabon. It's wow. Like <laughs> Co. Brandon. Yeah. Why not? Is that mostly in the millennials? Are they? Are they? Uh... A lot of people are looking for sweeter
So yeah. Thank you guys. All right. Are we allowed to ask you how you make money in We have a couple of minutes to set up for the next one. <laughs>